Thank you very much. That is another one of the big high points of SAC, year to year, our OEM panel. Uh, I'm still Rick Walker, I haven't changed, but I have the privilege of now introducing a couple of new keynote speakers for the uh, remainder of this afternoon before we move forward after that. I'd like to introduce first Carl Henson, who's the VP of Marketing and Business Development for MAU Workforce Solutions, and he will introduce our next keynote speaker. Thank you, Rick. Before I introduce that speaker, I want to tell you a little bit about MAU. Um, I, uh, first of all, just good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be representing MAU Workforce Solutions today. It's also uh, an honor to be a presenting sponsor here at the Southern Automotive Conference. MAU started in Georgia and has been part of the Southeast region for 45 years. Our firm has grown and we've seen the region grow as well. We've seen great expansion in manufacturing, which has led to more prosperity and more jobs for our communities. MAU started in the 1970s with our original founder, Bill Hatcher, with a borrowed typewriter, $500, and a dream. Today, MAU is one of the largest minority-owned staffing recruiting firms in the nation. MAU has extensive experience providing solutions for success in staffing, recruiting, technology, and outsourcing. Our relationships from world-class companies, training programs, and culture of family allow MAU to offer better results, better jobs, and ultimately, better lives for those who work with us. The two zones that are featured at this conference go hand in hand. Workforce development and innovation. These also tie very well with MAU. The first one, workforce development. We all understand the skills gap. Let me talk about a few of the stats. Over the next decade, nearly 3.5 million manufacturing jobs will be needed. Two million are expected to go unfilled due to the skills gap. 80% of manufacturers report a moderate or severe shortage of qualified applicants for skilled production positions. And for at least, or for the first time in at least a generation, Government figures show a large number of open jobs, about 6.7 million, than people out of work and looking for a position, which is around 6.3 million. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, MAU has met this challenge, and as a result, we created a skills school that provides solutions for training and development. One specific area where MAU has seen a lack of trained candidates is for material handling and forklift operators. As automation and technology increases, driving a forklift and tra training, it requires is much more complicated than it's been in the past. MAU Skill School has over 23,000 square feet of training space dedicated to improving safety, competency, and job readiness for new forklift drivers in a controlled environment. The second theme was innovation. Rapidly growing technology trends such as iCloud or cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and 3D printing are transforming the manufacturing industry. Automotive features we could only dream of five years ago are rapidly coming a reality. With the adoption of new technologies comes the demand for a whole new set of skill sets from the workforce. That is why MAU is very excited about our recent acquisition of Atlanta-based 3CI. 3CI is a technology staffing and consulting firm and has been providing solutions for nearly 40 years. This acquisition has allowed MAU to expand its current service offering to include expertise in technology staffing and consulting at a time when Georgia 
has staked his claim as the technology hub of the Southeast. As our clients continue to bring new technologies into their, new, their, their own organizations, we are able to bring more value by finding the talent to support their growth and innovation. We hope you enjoy the, the conference today. I hope, I, I hope you stop by our booth over at MAU so we can tell you a little bit more about us and how we can help you. But before I leave, it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Raj Batra is the president of the Di of Digital Factory Division of Siemens USA. Raj. Well, good afternoon. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for the opportunity here to talk a bit today about uh, how digitalization is helping manufacturers reinvent themselves. You know, manufacturing as a whole, you've heard a lot about it today, is experiencing a renaissance. Uh, and tomorrow, we have Manufacturing Day, which of course all, all of you know. Uh, across the United States, thousands of students, job seekers, are, are going to visit factories and plants to learn more about the types of skilled high-tech careers that manufacturing makes possible. So it's a great time to be a manufacturer and you know just think about some of the news and the optimism that we've seen recently. So very, very strong business confidence out there. Um, according to a recent National Association of Manufacturers survey, 95 percent of manufacturing has a very, very positive outlook for their company. It's, it's the highest level recorded in that survey's 20-year history. 86% of those people said they plan to increase investments thanks to tax reform. So we see this all the time. Companies that would uh, normally think about outsourcing manufacturing are bringing manufacturing back into the States, and that's an exciting time. Solid GDP growth, uh, the highest since 2014. But what I want to talk about today is the digital economy and what digital is driving inside of industry today. So, um, you know, the U.S. is growing at a faster pace. I should say the digital economy in the U.S. is growing at a much, much faster pace uh, than the overall economy and represents about 7% of our GDP. So consumer confidence is high, low unemployment, below 4%. The manufacturing unemployment is even lower. And um, so if you read any of the headlines, there's certainly no doubt that uh, U.S. manufacturing is firing on, on all cylinders, which is important for the constituency here. Trying to get the slides to advance. Okay, good. So, so here, you know, the, the digital disruption, the race is on. You know, and the strongest are certainly going to survive here. We see this in the consumer world, but it's making its way very, very quickly into industrial manufacturing. So new digital technologies are driving our economy in a number of unexpected directions. Uh, and, and if you think about what's happening in the consumer environment, which we all experience every day. So, so think about what's happened over the past five years. Uh, thinking about asking Alexa to play you the news checking in on an aging parent with a Nest Cam or a video feed or taking the stairs to your next meeting because a fitness band reminded you to be more active. And uh, you know, those are all just great examples of digital disruption that, that people could never expect. Um, and, and you know, think about this from the wearables market. The wearables technology market isn't even 10 years old. And Americans have already purchased about 77 million of these devices. And IDC projects that market's going to increase to 48 billion by 2023. And, and I think the Apple iWatch 4 is going to really help that uh, because they say it's a must-have device. So it just shows you how a market that didn't even exist has found its way on the radar, found its way on the map, and is mass influencing a lot of customers. Um, another major disruption happening is in the retail food industry. And according to research by the Food Marketing Institute, online grocery shopping is going to more than double, has more than doubled between 2016 and 2017. And based on these trends, the forecast says that 70% of U.S. shoppers could be online grocery shopping 
by as early as 2022. So finally, let's talk about the industry that we're here to, to represent, which is automotive. So the list of disruptions is really long here. You know, we talk about electric vehicles, electromobility, ride sharing, self-driving cars, new forms of car ownership, and all of these ideas are really challenging what it's traditionally meant to make, sell, and drive vehicles today. So, but what all of these examples have in common is, is, is pretty interesting. Consumers absolutely want innovation, they crave innovation. So we crave it in the consumer world, now we're craving it in industrial manufacturing, and we're craving it in, in, uh, in the industrial ecosystem. So 85% of Americans use AI. Um, I just read that 32% of adults already own a smart speaker, which is a device that was launched barely four years ago. And think about 32% of our population owning a smart speaker. So the rates of technology acceptance are staggering. Um, and, and if you think about this, it took 20 years for electricity to reach 30% of the population, 15 years for the internet, 15 years for the cell phone. So, so the digital transformation is massive. It's, it's already here. And it's quickly making its way into the industrial production environments. And I want to talk to you about what that means in the produ production environments and what digitalization is driving there. So, so companies understand they really have to embrace this. It's not an option of if, but when. And uh, many have already started. But let me start with the definition. You know, so when I think of this for us as Siemens, digitalization means taking the billions of intelligent devices, machines, data, creating a bridge between the virtual and real worlds, and then turning all of that into business value. Because you have to really generate business value uh, when you're talking about digital. People want ROI very, very quickly when they deploy digital, they want it scalable, and, and they want it to work fast. So, um, and you know, I, I don't want to read through all the stats there, but uh, connected devices are going to grow from eight billion to a trillion by 2030. A quarter of the world's economy is going to be digital. Um, half the world's data was generated in just less than last year, but, but only a very, very small percentage of that data is really being used today in manufacturing. And half the Fortune 500 has disappeared since 2000. And the main cited reason is digitalization. So it's disrupting incumbent revenue, it's disrupting EBITs of, of, of companies. So companies that aren't embracing this and getting on board are, are gonna be left in the dust. So companies really large and small understand there's a lot to be gained from driving that digital, digital transformation. And you know, and if you look at the trajectory, I mean, a lot of these changes are following what more or less happened inside of industry. So, um, and that, that hype has been building since the 1990s. So when you think about the 90s, people were automating more. And they were trying to get increments of productivity by automating their manufacturing processes, automating their, their uh, industrial manufacturing environments. But that only gave you a, 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 an increment of productivity. It didn't really uh, define the whole picture. And matter of fact, there are a lot of companies today that uh, still haven't fully embraced automation and they're dealing with aging assets and legacy that have, that have been on the floor for 30 or 40 years and you simply can't get productivity that way. So computers and networking advanced in the 2000s, and um, you know, we first started talking about the steps to integrate the automation and engineering processes. This made the value chain a bit more flexible, and today, fast forwarding to today, digitalization lets us create what we call a digital twin, a perfect virtual model of what we would do physically on a factory floor, what we would do physically in a design of a product, and, um, and when you look at that, that means we have a perfect digital copy of the product, the production process, and the performance. So the product and production can really be optimized together. And that gives you a very powerful tool when you're in manufacturing and you're trying to perfect processes. So, so more or less combining these real and virtual worlds, you know. Um, you know, we talk about this and we've been doing this since 2007. Um, and we have a big head start on, on people out there and really combining this and making it happen. So we were able to combine the real world of automation, which is what you see 
on the physical plant for, floor with the virtual world of software. And in the past, these worlds were very separate. Uh, and you know, if you think about the divide in these worlds, you had CIO organizations that were very, very strong, that more or less controlled the, the green part of this circle, and you had manufacturing production organizations that were very, very strong, that controlled the plant ecosystem. And in the middle was sort of a demilitarized zone where, where people didn't want to cross that really easily. Um, but you know, today the days arrived where um, these can be seamlessly integrated, um, and as Siemens, we base our portfolio on this idea because it gives customers a great competitive advantage on how to move forward. It gives them the ability to create a digital twin of the product, their production, the performance. And so let me just give you a couple of videos as to what makes up this, this, this digital twin, what we call a holistic digital twin. Because the more perfect that virtual copy is, the more accurately you can predict performance, and production and, and design. So here, you know, we first created a digital twin of the product. This is a good simulation and rendering of how we, how we design and simulate product. We designed the product, any product you can think of in an entirely virtual world. We use the same data model. You can run simulations to verify the product. If it doesn't work the way you intended, you really go back to the first step and, and, uh, and do a redesign. It lets you do all this virtually before you're doing physical prototype work. So this gives the designer of a product the confidence that it's going to work in the real world, and it's going to, it, it's going to be very, very close to what will happen in the real world. Uh, and this also means you need fewer, if any, physical prototypes. And next, we talk about the video of, of production. So the next step is to really plan the production process based on features of the product. So we simulate the working conditions of humans, of robots, production lines, or even entire plants, and we make sure that real production is going to run as intended, and that data created also serves as the basis for production engineering, and automated engineering allows us to automatically generate PLC code, things that were just unheard of in the past. So this is virtual commissioning. It saves us a lot of time, a, a lot of money, and even the behavior of real controllers can be simulated this way. And then, you know, we, we move to the digital twin of, of production. So we talked about the product, uh, we talked about the production, now we talk about, about the digital twin of production engineering. So the totally integrated automation concept has been around for a long time. It isn't new to Siemens. And it's been around since about 1996. And with this idea, we can take it much further. We enable smooth, efficient, uh, and most of all, very, very secure production uh, because we've simulated, commissioned, tested, and validated every detail in the virtual world before, again, we do any physical prototyping. So, but at this point, we're not only producing products, but we're also a huge amount of data. So in the real world, the digital twin of performance is constantly fed from the production facilities, which leads to a number of new insights. Um, and, and once that, once we also have the complex product, a medical device, a wind turbine, an aircraft carrier. Um, and once that product is manufactured and ready to be used, it also creates massive amounts of data. And I talked about that data not being very usable today. So that captured data running from a production line and a product can be used in what we call the digital performance twin. And that data is not just an end in itself, but you have to analyze it, distill it, and mine the business value out of it so it gives you better uptime, better predictive behavior of what's happening with production assets out on the factory floor. So, so this is the campus image that I like to talk about. And every manufacturing facility in the world divides itself this way. The question is how do you integrate it? How do you get better integrated gains out of, out, out, out of doing it? And, um, and before we look at this traditional factory of integrating design and manufacturing and analytics to, to make manufacturing more productive, um, I want to give you a video of a real, real uh, company that is facing extreme pressures, competitive pressure to win. And if they're not on the cutting edge of design and simulation and virtualization, they just don't win races. 
And it's a great testament to what companies do to, to really win and use technology as a competitive weapon, as a differentiator. So let me talk about Hendrick Motorsports here. And please, I hope you enjoy the video. There's a digital race that takes place um, far before we ever get to the racetrack. Engineering's the cornerstone of uh, performance in motorsports. Uh, we've got many engineers from uh, masters in mechanical engineering to aerodynamicists, fluid dynamicists, um, electrical engineers. You know, this is it. This is the premier uh, motorsports organization, at least in you know NASCAR racing. Our biggest thing here at, at Hendrick Motorsports is, is managing change. You know, our business changes so rapidly. We've got to have performance and we've got to have reliability. Having an engine that finishes the race but doesn't perform doesn't do you any good. In NASCAR they have what's called an open garage policy. The garage is a self-policing area so you park next to your strongest competitor and, and you know, you're kind of looking at what they do and they kind of look at what you do. So uh, the, the shelf life of a good idea is only a week or two. To reinvent yourself every week uh, from one race to the next is basically what we have to do. When you show up at the racetrack, you've basically got the product you're going to have. You're just doing little teeny things to try to get it fine-tuned. In the front of our transporter at every racetrack, um, there's five engineers and myself in the front of that transporter just trying to figure out how to build a faster and better mousetrap than the other guys. Whenever we have an issue at the racetrack, whether it's from a component failure standpoint or maybe from NASCAR coming to us saying that they don't like us doing whatever X component is, we immediately get in touch with the design staff at Hendrick Motorsports. They go through, uh, they make the revisions, they make changes, or they, they completely start over. We look at our race schedule, when you boil it down, it's essentially 36 product release dates every year. If NASCAR changes rules and we can take advantage of that rule faster than our competition, uh, we can win races. We've got uh, engine dynamometers and a lot of test equipment that can produce a tremendous amount of data. And being able to, to, to mine that data to get the value out of it is, is a key for us. So for a guy like myself to make decisions, yes, I want to know as much as I possibly can, but the facts are I only really need to know the high-level highlights so that I can point and say this is the direction that we need to go as a team, this is where we're going to head as a company. Our consumers of information, our engine assemblers, our shop people, they need to know very specific things and they need to know them fast. We don't want them to be software people. And so Team Center allows us to organize our business objects uh, pertinent to the information that they need to get. As engineers, what we want is we want to have all of the product data in one place that we can leverage it and optimize it and share it amongst the, the technical group here at Motorsports. As a company, we're able to, with the people that we have and the resources that we've got, um, they're able to come to us with answers, not just data. Because it wasn't so long ago, they came to us with all the data and it was all here, and, and then I had to go through and sift to figure out what it was. And so I use Team Center NX daily to design new parts, work on new solutions. But then also as a manager, uh, I'm using those tools to, uh, to look at problems. Uh, when we have a, an issue at the racetrack, we have to generate a problem report. Uh, you know, analyze that problem report. What solution do we need to implement to not allow this to happen again? You know, now it's evolved to where every component is drawn. Almost every component has gone through FEA. We went from being prototype to additive manufacturing. So now it truly is a manufacturing technology. We can take the NX tools and draw parts and make parts that you can't make any other way. I think it's really neat that I can sit down next to an engineer. Uh, myself, again, I'm not an engineer, so I, I need a visualization of what's actually going on. And they can pop up the product, whatever that component is, and they can just show me from a 3D view exactly what it is that they're building and where they're thinking. And I can help give a little direction and guidance from my standpoint and you know, push play and get the parts in our hands. Now, the key benefit that the Siemens software products give us here at Hendrick Motorsports is the speed of response to make a competitive change, to fix problems, and to create more performance at the racetrack in a very tight window of time. We have to continue to evolve. We have to continue to um, ask ourselves the, the tough questions, the hard questions. I work for the, the best team in motorsports with very driven individuals and a culture at Hendrick Motorsports that we have a, a responsibility to honor and, and keep up. We're just going to try to outwork everybody with the amazing resources we have at our fingertips. So great. Think of the think of the pressure of the Hendrick Motors team sports 
faces, and you know Jimmy Johnson's certainly a winner, but think of the pressure that that team faces. One week innovation cycles, the equivalent of 36 product launches a year, continuously optimizing product and performances to win races. They'll never get there without digitalization. You simply have to embrace it to stay on the cutting edge. So the ones that don't are left behind and you just don't win, and, and that's the consequence for a team like that. So Hendrick Motorsports is probably a, a good microcosm of the challenges that a lot of companies face. They may innovate faster and be forced to innovate faster, but finally at the end, um, that's what lets them really win races. And those are a lot of the challenges the automotive industry is facing today. So, so if I talk about Siemens, you know, we, we of course feel all the pain that our external environments feel, our external customers. We, we in our own right are one of the world's largest manufacturers. Uh, we have about 250 factories, manufacturing facilities around the world. We're transforming our own operations and going digital. And uh, I want to give you one example, which is, which is a factory we have in Hamburg, Germany. It opened in 89, and manufactures one, one of the probably highest volume products that we produce for the world. Um, a 50, 60 billion dollar install base of this product. Uh, it opened in 89, uh, and let me tell you what the digital transformation is doing here. So, without increasing the scale of the production area in this facility and almost no change to the staffing levels, the factory has increased its production output by 13 times. Every year, this factory manufactures about 16 million somatic products, meaning that one product is, is made every second with a quality rate of 99.9% or, a, 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 you know, if you know DPM, DPMs of, of less than 11. Um, and with any 24 hour period, products are made and ready to dispatch to any one of 60,000 customers around the world. So again, it's just a great example in our world what, what benchmark production is and what digitalization drives in that kind of benchmark production because you can never get there without digitalizing. So, you know, the Hendrick Motorsports and the story of Amberg aren't a fluke. They're, they're not one-off successes. It's technology that is deployable today. Um, and it's the natural result of when you combine the world's strongest automation portfolio with the world's strongest industrial software portfolio and um, with a portfolio of acquisitions that really drive to build the most holistic digital twin pro possible. So we're able to simulate, virtualize, and digitize anything physically in all its properties, from computational fluid dynamics, from uh, electronic board design, from mechanical simulation, from software simulation. So we can do everything virtually before you arrive physically at the plant floor. So, um, and this has been happening over the past two decades. And, and of course, to do that, it takes a very, very strong R&D and innovation pipeline and um, a very serious commitment to R&D. And I just remember, you know, when everyone was going through the 2008 crisis and people were cutting uh, non-top line generating activities, uh, you know, we never ratcheted back from, from the R&D portfolio. And it paid off big time for us in, in, in the decade to come. So, um, a lot of investment in R&D, a lot of investment in the automation and software portfolio, and that's the key component and, and, and the key ingredient to digitizing manufacturing operations and, and product design. Um, so, just at the end of the day, you know, in closing, um, you know, it's really about one simple idea, and that when you merge the virtual worlds and the real worlds, you really free yourself from from old style innovation. And, um, and the only mistake that you make is by not starting. So thank you very much, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot, I appreciate it.